Greetings to everyone as we gather for worship today. We are surely glad to welcome both visitors and members to our online worship. And if you are viewing this on Saturday evening, I trust that you will enjoy the extra hour of sleep. And if you're viewing on Sunday or afterwards, we welcome you back to Standard Time. I regret to say that this past week forced me to wearing my sweaters again. I always try to make it into November before I get my sweaters out. Missed it by a couple of days this year. Today is All Saints Day, and we will take time to remember those members of our church who have died over the past year. We celebrate the promise of the resurrection as they have passed from, from this life to the church triumphant. And as we celebrate their lives, we know that you may have lost loved ones over the past year. And so we invite you to speak their names as we remember the saints of God together. We're trying hard to anticipate what Christmas Eve will be like here at Bethlehem. We are certain that we will have an expanded schedule of services so that those who wish to share Christmas Eve worship may do so and be confident that it can be done in safety as we try to assure physical distancing and the other protocols that are required. We will be decorating the worship venues in both the sanctuary and the gymatorium, along with other locations to keep some of our beautiful traditions as best we can. But we must freely admit that the services will be different as choirs have not gathered. And we are also contemplating the need for tickets to attend services. So we need you to stay tuned for that particular announcement. We've never done that before, and so we want to try to do it well as we plan to uh, allow for maximum attendance, but at the same time um, allow for everyone to be safe. Uh, think about what it is that you might do as you anticipate the Christmas Eve services. Each year here at Bethlehem, we form a Christmas club. Members and friends make a $5 contribution or more, if you wish. The proceeds of those contributions allow us then to be of help to families who struggle through the Christmas season. I'm sure that we will have uh, more than we usually have this year, and so uh, we want to be able to be ready to help them through uh, the meaning of, uh, of what it means to uh, be generous with your children and with others through the Christmas season. Our newsletter for November is out. You can read the newsletter online to capture some of the other things that are coming up, such as poinsettia orders or the Christmas snack basket orders. So check it out. Um, it isn't normal, <laughs> but uh, ministry continues in many ways, and so we want you to be able to participate. We are participating in Operation Christmas Child once again. Boxes are available here at the church and may be picked up. If you wish to participate and cannot pick up a shoe box, you may go to the website, SamaritansPurse.org. That's all one word, SamaritansPurse.org backslash OCC. SamaritansPurse.org backslash OCC. A $25 contribution will fill the box and provide shipping and um, as a means by which to uh, keep us in touch with what they're doing with Operation Christmas Child, we think that you'll enjoy this video, which will help you know what to do. Thank you very much. It all goes great with a glass of milk. Packing an Operation Christmas Child shoe box. Okay, let's be honest. Packing an Operation Christmas Child shoebox can go great with anything. It's so that other kids can learn about Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, and it's also a great way to teach your own kids about giving. Teach your kids about giving. giving. Have a great day. Oh, and don't forget, make good choices. So basically, you get an empty box, which any box will work. Really? OK, not any box. Much better. OK, so now you have your empty box. Now you can pick the age range, and if you want it to be for a boy or a girl. Okay, come on, please be a boy. Please be a boy. Well, looks like we're gonna be packing for a boy this year. First, you can choose a wow item, such as a soccer ball, or a stuffed animal. Mm. 
And you can choose other fun toys, too. Hygiene items. Oh, and school supplies. There are, of course, some items you cannot pack. Like liquids. Food. Items related to war. Live animals. And don't even think about packing chocolate because it melts. No candy and no toothpaste. When your gift is finished, you can write a letter and include a photo. It gives it a nice personal touch. When your box is done, you can make your shipping donation online through Follow Your Box. Simply print off your tracking label to see where the destination of your gift will be. And don't forget, it's important to pray for the child that is receiving this gift because packing a box is a simple way to share the gospel with kids all around the world. Maybe even in... Nib... In Africa. Now that your box is done, it's time to get moving. Transport your box to a nearby drop-off location near you. These will be open all across the U.S. on National Collection Week, the third week in November. Drop it off and voila, you pack the shoebox. Easy as one, two, three. Let us pray. Living and loving Lord, we are in your presence once more. Our hearts are turned to you. We have many reasons to be thankful. There are loved ones who have been part of our lives. They're gone from our lives just now, but we remember them and, and count them among the saints who have demonstrated the way that leads to life and life eternal. We are here to worship and give you thanks for the many blessings that are part of our lives, not the least of which were those who have gone before. Thank you. Amen.
Please join me in the call to prayer and praise. Winds blow, rains fall, storms rage. God is our sanctuary and strength. Floods rise, waves batter, fires ravage. God is our strength and sanctuary. Violence threatens, hunger abounds, disease flourishes. God is our strength and sanctuary. We are safe here in this spirit place, for God's sustaining and nourishing spirit surrounds and affirms us. On another part of your bulletin, you will find a um, piece of uh, liturgy that will lead us to honor those who are of our congregation who have passed away. And so I, I invite you to take a moment and uh, find that and be prepared to join in that time of prayer and celebration. Now please join with me as we enter into this time of prayer and celebration, remembering and honoring the dead of our congregation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, says the Lord. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Let us open the door and invite the Lord into our hearts and into our lives as we gather for worship and lift our voices in praise as did our mothers and fathers in the faith. Today we recognize the saints of Bethlehem Church who have passed from this life to life eternal and triumphant in the presence of the living Christ in the kingdom of heaven. These have passed since we last celebrated All Saints Day in 2019. We would recognize family members and friends of our congregation, rememorialize those whom we love but see no more. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Patty Miller. We give God thanks for the memory of the life of Bruce Smith. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Eugene Gemmel. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Thomas Tome. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Matthew Winnicka. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Arabella Smeltzer. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Marguerite Cornball. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Helen Atkinson. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Catherine Shirey. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Jack Lescalit. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Lloyd Strayer. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Joan Thompson. We give God thanks in memory of the life of Carl Karmasek. And we give God thanks in memory of the life of Burl Gingrich. Again, will you join me in this call to prayer? Like the faithful ones who have gone before us, let us keep our eyes focused on Jesus, our hearts set on God's love, our hands ready to bind up the hurts of creation and all people, our feet ready to go the extra mile. Let our eyes see light even within the darkness and glimpse potential where others see dead ends. Give us mouths eager to sing God's praise and hearts yearning to rejoice like the ones who have gone before us. Let us follow as part of the communion of saints. Let us pray together. Today we look back and remember the saints who have brought our community to this time and place, 
our spiritual parents and grandparents. Also, as people of faith, we not only look back and remember their work and impact, but we also look forward. We look forward to the reward in which they already share. We look forward to the tomorrow in which death and crying will be no more. We look forward to the fulfillment of your promises for us. God, on this day, when we honor the saints, we pray for your loving presence to be felt by these gathered, and especially by those who cannot be here today because of life's struggles. Amen. We enter into a time of silent prayer and meditation. And again, let us pray together. Almighty God, redeeming Lord, renewing spirit, send your blessing upon your people that we may grow mature in faith, hope, and love. Renew our spirits that we may have the strength of will to work for the renewal of our world. Lead us and equip us to serve those for whom the world has little understanding and less care. Grant us grace to resist evil fearlessly as you renew us day by day. So through us work to renew hope for the hopeless, love for the unloved, and peace to the troubled. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for all those who have come before us, leaving us a legacy of faith. Thank you for the myriad ways they have modeled for us what it means to love you and love one another. We are grateful for the sacrifices they made and the gifts they shared and the time they gave so that your gospel might be proclaimed from this place and among these people. Gracious God, the baton has now been passed to us. Grant us wisdom and discernment. 
unity of spirit and courage that we might continue the good work that was begun by others. We pray in Christ's name and for the sake of his kingdom, remembering how Jesus taught us to pray as we now pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather the children around, I want to uh, think about a song that used to be quite popular, and maybe it's a song that they have heard. It's a song that I, I think that uh, uh, is good for us to learn uh, most of the time, uh, even though it uh, has a little bit of silliness to it. It goes like this. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. 
be happy, don't worry now. That's a song that tells us not to worry. A lot of people worry about a lot of things. Um, some of us are worry warts. That is to say, we seem to find all kinds of things to worry about. And I'm wondering what you worry about. Another word for worry is to be anxious. What are you anxious about? What bothers you and makes you worry? We're usually anxious. We usually worry about things that we're afraid of. Some people are afraid of climbing ladders. They're afraid of heights, and they hate to climb ladders. This is a season when many of us are afraid because we've just passed through Halloween. Halloween uh, makes people afraid. What are you afraid of at Halloween? Maybe ghosts or witches or monsters. They all are part of Halloween, and the scarier the better, sometimes we say. We worry about meeting up with these creatures. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the dark? Are you afraid of strange places where you've never been before and you're not sure you will be able to find your way? Are you afraid of going somewhere where you don't know anyone else and you will be a stranger? We worry about things. We worry about things. There's another kind of worrying that uh, people do and uh, I have here a glass of water. And as you see, the glass of water is filled just about to the halfway mark. You can tell me how much water is in the glass, but I was pretty careful to make the glass half full. And that's what some people say. The glass is half full, while other people say, no, the glass is half empty. And we begin to think that uh, people who uh, are happy with life, that are thankful for what they have, who are optimistic, we call them optimists, will see this glass and say, well, that glass is half full. And they're happy about it. They don't care about what they do not have. But then there are the half empty people who say, boy, I wish I had more in there. I think that uh, I'm sad that I don't have more. And we need to be sure that we are optimists and not pessimists. Optimists and not pessimists. Well, I think we all want to be half full persons. Think about that. Do not worry about anything. Do not worry about anything, Jesus said. In fact, he says, do not worry about anything except God's kingdom. Put God's, God's kingdom first and God's righteousness. And all of these things, he said, will be yours as well. That's what our lesson is about today. Making sure that we are people who know that our glass is half full. We are optimists. We are not pessimists. Let's pray. Lord, we know that... Uh, so often we do worry, sometimes about little things that aren't worth worrying about. In fact, when we worry, it doesn't seem to change a thing. We're still afraid of the same old things that we were before. So take away our worry and help us to remember that little song. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. Amen. As we prepare to uh, think about what our offering will be, we remind you that there are means by which to give electronically. Uh, we encourage you to visit our website, go to Bethlehem.org, and there you will find a button that you can press that leads to Vanco. Vanco is the company that we use for our electronic giving. We also have an app for your phone called Give Plus. 
It is run by Vanco and is connected so that you can do this very safely, uh, very securely, and uh, with no worries, since that's our topic of the day, with no worries. We want to, uh, to of course, uh, remind, uh, be reminded of uh, the fact that we are, um, next week, going to be giving a, another significant gift to the food bank that will put us over the 25,000 mark significantly. And in doing so, um, we trying to um, meet what we think are some of the greatest needs that are occurring in the midst of, uh, in the midst of life during the pandemic. And one of those is food insecurity one of the greatest needs any of us can have. And so we are uh, partnering with the Food Bank and with uh, Red Lion uh, Community Reach in order to meet the food requirements uh, that some people may have during these days of economic recovery. So let's uh, think about that as we prepare to give um, and the means by which you give. Uh, all are welcome. And we thank you for being faithful. We're doing well. And uh, that only comes when we say thank you. With gratitude, we are amazed at uh, the work that we've been able to accomplish. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, we never want to take you for granted. Your blessings come in ways that are too numerous for us to count. And so as we begin to think about the means by which you bless us, help us to know that the only reason we are blessed is so that we can become a blessing to others. Some people don't understand that, but we do. And we want to make good on your instruction that we bless others in your name. Thank you. Amen. As we continue our study on the Sermon on the Mount, we come now to the end of chapter 6, the second chapter of that sermon. And I invite you to join in reading with me Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own.
So let me ask you, do we have any worriers in the house? Do we? Let me take you back a few decades to 1954 with this picture, for that was the first year this character appeared in a zany magazine named Mad Magazine. Do you remember this guy? That's right, it's Alfred E. Newman. Do you recall his motto for life? What me worry? And that is how he was betrayed, with seemingly not a care in the world. There is a phrase that is commonly used, four words, which are among the most useless words in the English language. Don't worry about it. In our high anxiety days, very few people have found comfort in those words. We hold fast to our worries. If you lived in an Italian neighborhood in New York City, you might hear it said a little bit differently, but it would sound like this. Forget about it. Forget about it. And lately, there is a new phrase that has me wondering. As I make my apologies, someone will say, no worries, no worries. Does it mean my apology is accepted or that the person I am speaking with could care less about my apology? And then there is uh, the song by Bobby McFerrin that I sang for the children, which says, here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. Well, to be sure, ridding ourselves of worry is a good idea, but those who tend to worry will probably not let go of those worries just because we said so. After all, we have important things to worry about, don't we? For we must admit, we live in historically anxious days. And so people are worried. They are worried about the virus. They are worried about their elder family members. They are worried about their kids and school decisions. They are worried about other health matters. They are worried about global warming. They are worried about job security and their next paycheck. They are worried about violence. They are worried about the visitation of the next terrorists and whether they will be foreign terrorists or homegrown. This week, they are worried about going to vote. What will they find there, they wonder. Fear seems to be the power that runs our day. It seems that if you name it, someone is worrying about it somewhere. Other possible but improbable things exist about which we could worry. Shark attacks when swimming in the Atlantic Ocean, the collapse of the economy, getting hit by an asteroid, you name it. Someone is probably worrying about it. The field of psychology draws uh, the difference between acute and chronic anxiety. So what do you think? If you step out of your front door and come face to face with the grizzly bear, is that acute or chronic anxiety? <laughs> well, it's acute anxiety, to be sure, face to face with the grizzly. However, if you wake up each morning with a sense of free-floating dread, but you have little idea where those dark feelings come from, nor do you have any idea when or how you will break free from those, then chances are you are dealing with chronic anxiety. The word anxious is historically related to a Latin word, angre, which literally means to choke or strangle. Should anxiety or worry get their bony fingers around your neck for any length of time, you'll soon be gasping for breath. There's another English word that traces its lineage back to the same Latin root. The word is Angina. Angina is the sharp, piercing pain that often precedes a heart attack. Angina arises when one of the coronary arteries becomes choked off by arterial plaque, blocking oxygen from reaching the heart muscle. Anxiety, worry, in other words, through angina, can have a part in killing you. Another English word that grows out of this Latin root is anger. Anxious people, as it so happens, are often angry people. They sense the breath of life being choked off from their soul, and so they lash out, flailing wildly to remove that threat, whatever they imagine it to be. Anxious, angina, anger. 
the ingredients of a chronic worry complex challenges us today. The headlines have sounded the alarm for so long that we sometimes come to believe that the world is a fundamentally scary place. And let's be clear, you and I are not the first. We're not the first. Flood and famine, they're not peculiar to our day. The Hebrew people, they knew slavery in Egypt. They knew fear during the Exodus when they had no home. When they finally inherited the Promised Land, they prospered for a short while, but then, out of their unfaithfulness, they were conquered and then led into captivity in Babylon. Isaiah spoke in those days, I tell you this, because worry and anxiety, both individual and national, are not new, not new to us. To the Israelites in the Babylonian captivity, Isaiah spoke these words of comfort as he wrote, Fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are are mine. That's a wonderful memory verse. I commend it to you to be memorized. And when you come to a time of worry that just won't go away, remember God calls you by name and you are his. What comfort. What comfort. A Sermon on the Mount Christians, we are given strong encouragement to put worry away, to put it away. Does that fit your life pattern? Have you been paralyzed by worry from time to time? Have you? Think about the question Jesus asks. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Or does worrying do you any good? It may just do the opposite. In December 2006, an issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings Medical Journal Researchers studied to find that worry cannot add a single hour to a person's life and that Jesus was right. But they discovered a bit more, that not being a chronic worrier can, in fact, add years to the span of life. In the mid-60s, some 7,000 students at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill took the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI, a dreaded test. But it is a test that, among other things, measured the participants' tendency to be optimistic or pessimistic. You know, the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. Of that group, 1,630 were found by the test to be clearly pessimists and 923 to be clearly optimists. The rest fell somewhere in the middle of that continuum between the clear extremes of optimism and pessimism. Over the next four decades, 476 of those who had taken the test died. And they died from causes ranging from accidents to illness to suicide to homicide. By tracking and collating all this information, Researchers determined that the pessimists had a significantly greater likelihood of dying sooner from any cause than did the optimists. As the language of the findings report puts it, those who scored as pessimists had decreased rates of longevity compared with those who were optimistic individuals. It was also said the current results replicate in non-medical a non-medical sample those of earlier studies that suggest that optimism is associated with increased survival. Can we simplify their findings? Worrying isn't likely to add even one hour to your life. So get rid of worry. And to you the study shows that you might just live longer if you do that. Of course, pessimism and worry are not 
entirely identical. Pessimism is the tendency to take a gloomy view of life and to drift or march toward negative outcomes. Worry is a mental and emotional response of concern or even fear to vague or unspecified threats or those negative outcomes. To describe the difference another way, we could say that pessimism is an outlook about things in general and worry is an outlook about things in particular. Yet at the root, both pessimism and worry are related to a shortage of hope and of trust. Hope and of trust. Pessimism, which has no confidence that things will work out, can breed despair. Despair is a word that literally means unhope. Unhope. In the New Testament reading where Jesus posed this question about adding to our span through worry, he went on to make clear that what he was calling for instead was for us to trust God. He pointed to the birds that do not sow or reap and to the fields as they are fed by the Heavenly Father. Nonetheless, the Father cares for them. Then he pointed to the flowers that do not toil or spin, but are clothed in beauty by the Heavenly Father anyway. It's critical to understand, however, that his words were directed to people who did have to sow, who did have to reap, who toiled and spun. And he wasn't telling them to stop doing those things. He simply wanted them to understand that their lives were a lot more than the sum of their sowing and reaping and toiling and spinning, or the length of their Facebook profile, or the number of friends they have on social media. Further, Jesus tied the call to not worry, not worry, to the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That is a significant linkage because God's kingdom is the ultimate reason, the ultimate reason for optimism and hope. The very meaning of the kingdom is that God and those who stand with God win. God wins. In the end, good triumphs over evil. As a believer, you are a citizen of God's kingdom. You might feel pessimistic about human activity in the short term, but you've got every reason to be optimistic about God's activity in the long term. While in seminary in 1980, I was asked by a seminary friend to speak at his wedding. So Kathy and I traveled to Minneapolis where this wedding was to take place. And as the one who was supposed to deliver the message of the day, I chose this particular text. There are times when relationships get out of focus, including marriages. What is it that might snap them back to attention? Well, how about having the common goal of seeking God's kingdom and make that remain at the heart of it all? It works for marriage. It works for family. It works in your place of employment. Seek God's kingdom wherever you are. Seek it first. That is the attitude that can change everything and can add meaning to your life. There's a beautiful story that tells how this works. Several years ago, a school teacher who served on special assignment with children who were confined to a large city hospital she received a routine call requesting that she visit a particular child who had been admitted and would be there for a long stay. She took down the boy's name, took down his room number, number 409, and was told by the boy's regular teacher, we are studying nouns and adverbs now, and this boy needs help so that he will not fall behind. It wasn't until the visiting teacher reached the boy's room that she realized that she was located in the hospital's burn unit. No one had prepared her to confront a boy who had been horribly burned over much of his body and who was in great pain. She wanted to turn on her heel and walk out of 409, but she stammered, I'm the hospital teacher. 
and I am here to help you with nouns and adverbs. Well, because of his condition, the boy could barely respond. The teacher stumbled through the grammar lesson, but felt guilty for asking the boy questions or trying to correct him. The next morning, however, this teacher ran into a nurse on the burn unit who asked her, what did you do to the boy in 409? The teacher started to apologize, but the nurse interrupted, you don't understand. We've been concerned about that boy. But ever since you were there with him yesterday, his whole attitude has changed and he's fighting back, responding to treatment like he wants to live. The boy himself later explained with tears rimming his eyes to the teacher, I had given up. At the lowest moment, the teacher came into my room. I suddenly realized that they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? And I decided I want to get well, if they thought I could. So I prayed, asking God to help me want to live. And here I am. The signs all around us may point to death and destruction. We might have every reason to be pessimistic Every reason to worry that life, not, life might not just be worth it. We might lose hope. And that is the exact time to get on the kingdom train. The kingdom train. Throw worry away. Replace pessimism with optimism. Cut the anxiety. Cut out hopelessness and replace it with hopefulness. All things are possible with God. And if God wants to keep us working on our nouns and adverbs, then you and I, we better keep at it. There's a lot of life yet to live and a lot of work yet to be done. Don't you think? Don't you think? No worries. No worries. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Wow. That is some promise. Amen and amen.
And now be blessed with the benediction. May the blessings of God our Father, grace, mercy, peace, and love, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen.